Yay. Hi, my name is Jennifer Siever. This is the first of multiple lectures we hope to have on campus as part of the Independent Voices Lecture Series. Our goal is to have credible speakers from around the world bring their expertise to their respective topics and offer an independent perspective on the Middle East. I want to thank the Israel Campus Roundtable, the David Project, Israel on Campus Coalition, the Watson, Watson Institute for International Studies, Brown Students for Israel, Brown Risky Club, and the Middle Eastern Studies Department for their sponsorship of this event. And for our first speaker in the series, it's my honor to introduce Colonel Richard Kemp. Richard Kemp, commander of the Order of the British Empire, served in the British Army from 1977 to 2006. He's completed 14 tours, bringing him to conflicts in Macedonia, Northern Ireland, Iraq, and Bosnia. As commander of British forces in Afghanistan, he was also involved in devising strategies and policies on counterterrorism. Following Israel's cast-led operation in Gaza in December of 2008 and the publication of the Goldstone Report in 2009, Colonel Richard Kemp made a presentation to the United Nations Human Rights Council stating his position on these issues. We are honored to have him here at Brown tonight to share with us his independent voice, Colonel Richard Kemp. here tonight, but um, I promise you I'm not going to cause any trouble, so <laughs> don't shoot. <laughs> having a bit of a technical problem here, but uh, I can figure it out. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a, uh, it's a very great pleasure to be here at the, the college in the English colony of Rhode Island. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the college in the English colony of Rhode Island and Providence plantations. I don't, is there something funny about that? <laughs> okay, so maybe you've changed your name and nobody told me. But uh, just 10 years after your university here was founded under a charter that was granted by King George III, your king. My regiment <laughs> arrived in Boston, and it was known then as His Majesty's 10th Regiment of Foot, and it's now called the Royal Anglian Regiment. That was 237 years ago this month, on the 3rd of November, 1774. The regiment fought in the battles of Lexington Green and Concord's North Bridge, on the 19th of April, 1775. Skirmishes that marked the outbreak of armed conflict between Great Britain and her 13 colonies on the mainland of British North America. A short time later, the 10th of Foot, my regiment, fought in the Battle of Bunkers Hill during the Siege of Boston. And their final action in the War of Independence was just down the road from here, at Newport during the Battle of Rhode Island in August 1778. A month later, the regiment embarked for England, having been away from its home territory for 48 years. Over the next 200 years, the regiment was involved in bloody battles all over the globe. But most recently, they fought many times in Afghanistan and in Iraq. And tonight, the young men of my regiment are preparing to deploy yet again to the killing fields of Helmand, where sadly, three British soldiers have been killed in the last two days. Looking around the room at some of you, uh, I feel actually old enough to have been present for most of my regiment's battles over the last 200 years. But actually, I've only been with them for the last 30 years or so. Much of that time, I've spent combating terrorism and insurgency in different parts of the world, including in the United Kingdom itself, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, elsewhere in the Middle East, and in India and the Balkans. 
It's in the context of that experience that I'm going to make some remarks to you this evening. Remarks that I hope are objective about a challenge to the Israeli government and the Israeli Defence Forces that is constant and is growing. A challenge that, if not met, could affect all Western nations, including your nation here in the United States of America and mine in the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. I'm talking about the second front that is now and is increasingly an ever-present factor in every single modern-day conflict. The war of words. In the era of 24-hour news, the internet, and ever-expanding social media, this has taken on an importance that would hitherto have been unimaginable. It has impacted particularly on the Israel-Palestine conflict. Those who consider the State of Israel to be an illegitimate entity, including Hamas, Fatah, Hezbollah, Iran, and other regional players, concentrate increasing effort on using every single action by Israel's armed forces as a tool to undermine the country's legitimacy. In many cases, international bodies, such as the United Nations Human Rights Council and other human rights organizations, have been used as writing, as witting or unwitting vehicles in this relentless effort. A central aim in the campaign of delegitimization is to give validity and justification to attacks on Israel by groups such as Hamas and Hezbollah, allowing them to strike at Israel with impunity in the international context, and encouraging the view that retaliatory or defensive measures by Israel are, by definition, disproportionate and must be criminalised. The more traction, ladies and gentlemen, that this objective is allowed to gain, the greater the instability between Israel and her neighbours, the less chance of any lasting peace, the more that blood will be shed on all sides in the region. All too often, a level of criticism is applied to Israel that is never applied to any other Western democratically accountable armed forces. A different standard is demanded. Let me give you some examples. In his report for the UN Human Rights Council on the 2009 Gaza conflict, Judge Goldstone concluded that Israel had been guilty of, and I quote, violations of international human rights and humanitarian law and possible war crimes and crimes against humanity. He later explained, and again I quote from Judge Goldstone's own words, he later explained that his allegations of intentionality by Israel were based on the deaths of and injuries to civilians, listen to this carefully, in situations where our fact-finding mission had no evidence on which to draw any other reasonable conclusion. I don't know if any of you, ladies and gentlemen, are students of law, but this is a somewhat odd approach, in my view, by a well-respected and highly experienced jurist who might normally be expected to work on the principle of innocent until proven guilty. But that is not the case, apparently, for Israel. Judge Goldstone found that the IDF had, and I quote again, a deliberate policy of disproportionate force aimed not at the enemy, but at the civilian population. This finding was based in large part on the ratio of civilian to military deaths inflicted by the IDF in Gaza. Goldstone, in common with groups including Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, found, and remember these figures please, found that five out of every six deaths during the conflict were non-combatants. Five 
out of every six deaths were innocent people who were not involved in fighting. That, is, that was the view of Judge Goldstone, of Amnesty International and of Human Rights Watch. It was also supported by figures provided by Palestinian groups, including Hamas. But in November 2010, a year later, the Hamas interior minister, Fatih Hamad, contradicted Hamas's previous position. And he said that the deaths had been of an altogether different order. Contrary to his much lower previous estimates, Fatih Hamad said that Hamas and affiliated militias lost 600 to 700 fighters in the conflict. That means that fewer than one in two of the fatalities during the fighting were non-combatants. One in two. A very different picture from the one Goldstone painted, which was, if you recall, five to one. Of course, every civilian death in war is a tragedy. But a study published by the United Nations Secretary General shows that there has been, on average, a three to one ratio of civilian to military deaths in asymmetric conflicts worldwide. Three civilians, three uninvolved people to every one fighter killed. That is the UN's estimate for Afghanistan three to one so far. In Iraq and in Kosovo, the United Nations estimates a higher ratio, four civilians to every combatant killed. A ratio of under one civilian killed for every combatant, which was Hamas's figure for the Gaza conflict, a figure agreed also by Israel, undermines the widely held assertion that Israel deliberately and systematically targeted the civilian population. One to one, three times fewer, three times fewer civilians killed in the Gaza conflict than in any other similar conflict since the Second World War. Of course, Judge Goldstone in April this year, changed his mind. He changed his mind. Judge Goldstone said that, and I quote from Judge Goldstone, while the investigations published by the Israeli military and recognised in the UN Committee's report have established the validity of some incidents that we investigated in cases involving individual soldiers, they also indicate that civilians were not intentionally targeted as a matter of policy. Goldstone's retraction on that issue was largely ignored in the international media, despite the enormous attention placed on his report when he said the opposite. Other members of Judge Goldstone's panel do not accept his changing of his mind. Most notably, his military advisor, retired Colonel Desmond Travis, late of the Irish Army. Colonel Travis was the only former military officer in Goldstone's team, and therefore he was responsible for the military analysis that provided the basis for condemning Israel for war crimes. In October 2009, Colonel Travis explained in an interview with Harper's Magazine why he had concluded that Hamas did not use mosques in Gaza to store munitions. Colonel Travis said, if I were a Hamas operative, the last place I would store munitions would be in a mosque. It's not secure, it's very visible, and will probably be pre-targeted by Israeli surveillance. That was his reason. That was why he said that Hamas did not use mosques for storing weapons because he wouldn't have done so. That was, his, that was his evidence. Colonel Travis dismissed as twaddle 
a subsequent finding by fellow Irishman and former British Army Colonel Tim Collins that he had found evidence of explosives stored in the cellar of a mosque in Gaza that had been destroyed by the IDF because it had been a weapons depot. I suspect many other British officers who are today fighting in Afghanistan would dispute Colonel Travis's assumptions about the likelihood of mosques being used for weapons storage because it is, ladies and gentlemen, a common practice. As Judge Goldstone's report was going to press on the 4th of September 2009, a tragic incident that received little international attention was unfolding in Kunduz, northern Afghanistan. I very much doubt any of you here have heard of it. By night, on the 4th of September 2009, a fuel tanker resupplying a German army base had been hijacked by the Taliban. They had promptly got the vehicle bogged in and rather than abandon its precious load of fuel, corralled local villagers to siphon off the fuel and take it away in buckets, cans, any other container they could get their hands on. As this was happening, the German commander called for an airstrike on the tanker by US planes apparently claiming the forces in his base were in danger. Just picture the situation. A fuel tanker bogged in, swarming with civilians who had been forced to remove fuel from the fuel tanker, and the German commander called in an airstrike. Well, the airstrike came in. It was actually an American aircraft called in by the German military commander on the ground, and a handful of Taliban were killed. But so ladies and gentlemen, were 70 civilians, innocent civilians, including 24 children under the age of 18. Now, I don't want to go into detail about the culpability of the commander's role here, or the fog of war um, that played a role in that incident. And I don't use that example in order to criticise or condemn the German army. It was the German army's first offensive action since the end of the Second World War. But I'm not using it to criticise the German army. I use it only as an example of the kind of terrible action that occurs in conflict, including with democratically accountable armies like the German army is. But these terrible actions do not attract the same degree of international condemnation as we would have seen had Israel been involved in that action. Ladies and gentlemen, as for Operation Cast Lead in Gaza, so too for the Gaza flotilla incident. Human rights groups, international law experts, politicians and the world's media have stridently proclaimed that the naval blockade of Gaza by Israel is illegal, including, predictably enough, the UN Human Rights Council's fact-finding mission, which made its report in September 2010. If Israel's blockade of Gaza is illegal, then was the boarding by the British Royal Navy of the 500-foot cargo ship Nisha in December 2001 also illegal? The Indian-owned ship Nisa, sailing from Mauritius and bound to London, was suspected, erroneously as it turned out, of having Al-Qaeda terrorist materials on board, and it was intercepted in international waters. During the provisional IRA terror campaign in the 70s and 80s, the Royal Navy, the Irish Navy and the French Navy often boarded ships heading towards Ireland from Libya and searched them for munitions. This was at a time when Captain Gaddafi's Libya was arming the IRA with weapons, missiles and explosives. I should explain why I call him Captain Gaddafi. Um, <clears throat> the reason is I, I'm, I'm a colonel and I don't wish to be associated with Gaddafi, even if he's dead. Gaddafi was never a colonel, he was a captain and he, when he made himself uh, the dictator of Libya he also promoted himself to colonel. And while I'm very happy 
to be associated with legitimate kernels, such as that very fine kernel that invented Kentucky Fried Chicken, <laughs> Colonel Sanders. I don't want to be associated with Gaddafi. Thank you. In 2004, a British-led naval task force made up of ships from France, Spain, Italy, Portugal, Germany, New Zealand, Australia and Pakistan blockaded the Gulf of Oman to intercept terrorists and munitions heading for the fight in Iraq. And most recently, NATO has been blockading Gaddafi's Libya, an operation with an identical purpose to the Gaza maritime blockade. A blockade, the blockade of Libya, in which, with supreme irony, Turkey was playing a role. Turkey, which has led the condemnation of Israel for its blockade of Gaza. Now, terrible things happened during the boarding of the Mavi Marmara, but ladies and gentlemen, I can imagine what would have happened if a ship containing people who were attacking them had been assaulted by Turkish commandos. I've seen Turkish commandos in action. The commission appointed by the UN Secretary General to investigate the Gaza flotilla incident, chaired by former New Zealand Prime Minister Sir Geoffrey Palmer, reported a couple of months ago. It found that the Israeli blockade was legal appropriate and consistent with international law. It asserted that Israeli use of force was morally justified and confirmed that when Israeli commandos boarded the ship, they faced, and I quote, organized and violent resistance from a group of passengers. But the commission also found that the use of force by Israeli troops once on board the vessel was excessive and unreasonable. Israel's own investigation into the incident, the Turkel Commission, also criticised the IDF action, suggesting that the force boarded the ship unprepared for the violent attack that they sustained. I think any Western military commander would have serious questions to ask about the intelligence and planning process that preceded the boarding operation, which together with the malign intent of some of those on board, placed the commandos into a nightmare situation, ultimately leading to nine dead and many wounded. On August the 18th this year, a multiple terrorist attack launched into Israeli territory from Sinai Kill, killed eight Israelis. Israeli intelligence identified the Gaza-based Popular Resistance Committee as responsible for the attack and launched airstrikes against the PRC in Rafah, killing five of its leaders, including the military commander that Israeli intelligence believed had planned the attack. The Israeli response seemed to have provoked greater international outcry than the terrorist attack itself. Ladies and gentlemen, you may not know this part, and it's in stark contrast to Turkey's reaction to an attack by the Kurdish PKK the day before the Sinai attack on 17th of August that killed nine Turkish soldiers in Turkey. The day before the attack uh, on the, from the Sinai. Turkey's airstrikes against Kurdish bases in northern Iraq that followed that attack killed at least 160 to 200 people, according to Turkish general staff sources. But has this action been met by any significant international outcry? No, it has not. Indeed, it hasn't received any significant attention in the international media. And not only did that occur, but it, a number of heavy airstrikes have occurred in northern Iraq by Turkey even in the last few weeks. Do you know about them? No, you won't do, because it's not mentioned in the media, despite the hundreds that Turkey has killed with those airstrikes. Of course the circumstances are different in every case, 
But these three examples I've mentioned, Operation Castled and the other side of the coin, the German operation in Kunduz, the, the Gaza flotilla, the, the blockade, and the various other blockades that have taken place, including the blockade of Libya, the Israeli airstrike on people who launched an attack on Israel from Sinai, contrasted with the Turkish airstrike on northern Iraq. Very different. But these examples suggest a clear pattern of the effective application of double standards against Israeli military operations as compared to those of other Western democratic states. Of course, there are many more comparisons that could be drawn involving the UK, the US, Turkey, and other NATO nations. Not to mention the actions of dictators around the world, which of course bear no comparison. Just think of what is happening in Syria. 3,500 people killed in Syria since May, and that's only a fraction of the Syrians that were slaughtered by the current president's father in the same place. Yet it's often the representatives of these dictatorships who sit on bodies like the UN Human Rights Commission and most vocally allege that Israel is guilty of war crimes. The Israeli military is of course not beyond criticism. Like military forces everywhere, including the United States and British armies, the IDF has its share of bad soldiers and bad commanders who are incompetent, negligent, who deliberately break the law and who are guilty of human error. Errors, of course, that are amplified in the friction and confusion of lethal combat. It is certainly true that the Israeli Defence Forces, like the British and American armies, have not always lived up to their own fighting ideals. But then few other armies ever wrote higher ideals to live up to. Certainly, the armies of so many of the states that are so blistering in their criticism of Israeli forces have no such ideals at all. It is quite right that the IDF's actions should be scrutinised by international bodies as well as Israel's own democratically accountable national institutions. But only to the same extent as the actions of, for example, the British, the Americans, the Germans or the Turkish armed forces are criticised and scrutinised. Those who accept Israel's right to exist must also accept her right to self-defence. For democratic nations and credible, respected international bodies to support the distortion and manipulation of Israel's military actions by those who wish to use them as a means of delegitimizing the state of Israel, emboldens extremists and causes further bloodshed. When their human shield tactics are validated, as they were validated by Judge Goldstone, it serves only to encourage the abuse of civilians as a weapon of war by extremists and insurgents. We should be alert to the reality that the so-called war crimes which Israel is unjustly condemned for today, other Western democracies such as yours and mine may well be condemned for tomorrow. As human rights organisations with political agendas that go beyond human rights alone seize upon established precedent to try and further tie the hands of our own forces, whose job is already hard enough in counterinsurgents that use their own people as human shields and seek to exploit the suffering of their own civilian populations as both tactical and strategic weapons. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Any questions? And Jen, would you mind telling me to shut up when you've had enough? Because I, I, I like to go on talking uh, about myself or about anything else. But um, please tell me when, when the time has come. Or I, I'm sure I'll get the message when people start to drift out anyway. Madam. You know, it's a great honor to meet a British subject that, after my memory of the British blockade of Palestine preventing Jewish refugees from Nazi Germany and Nazi Europe, from landing refuge 
And now we have a British subject who is so clarified and so astute, knowledgeable, and who is so fair-minded, and it's an honor to hear you speak. Thank you very much, Nima. I, I do think, I just, I, I know that wasn't quite a question, but I, I, will, <laughs> I will comment on it. And what I'll say about it is that um, Britain, I, I will be the first to admit that Britain has not always been a good friend to Israel. In fact, I think you have to go back probably to about 1917, and the Balfour Declaration, which was about the last time that Britain as a nation really uh, was a friend and acted in Israel's interests, even though at that time I don't think there was even an Israel. But um, what I would say is that behind the scenes there is a great deal of cooperation on the military level and in intelligence between Great Britain and Israel, in the same way as there is between the United States and Israel. And in fact, this morning at a, at a gathering of... Um, the friends of the IDF that I was privileged to attend last night and this morning. Um, I was having a conversation with a former head of Mossad, which is the Israeli intelligence services, um, who, who we both agreed, I think, that the, 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 the union between Britain, America and Israel on the intelligence side is stronger than any other three international collaborations on intelligence. So I take your point entirely, and, and I agree with you that, uh, that Britain has not been a great friend to Israel, and sometimes is not even a great friend today. Thank you for making it. Uh, before I come to you, slightly, shall we say, more senior members of the audience, can I turn to um, some of the more junior ones? Sir, yes. Uh, my question is, uh, the fact that you said uh, that there's more uh, of attention to what Israel does uh, compared to what other country, uh, countries are doing, May, the reason might be like Israel is being uh, doing that repeatedly since like I don't know since I can't remember. But uh, for example, the example you said about Germany, maybe that's the only uh, time that uh, Germany army did that, or maybe other countries. Maybe they don't have that bad uh, reputation of doing all these, uh, let's say, war crimes. Yeah. So that that might uh, I mean bring up more attention to like the country which is repeatedly yeah. doing something yeah. and, uh, for, and for example you can say that uh, German army, uh, army which the German commander was uh, in a situation which he never uh, was before but like Israel is in the same situation for example when the people from Palestine uh, crossed the border uh, that, that's what I, I have in mind as a uh, in like in proportionate uh, uh, like uh, action. Yeah. That's I mean like for the first time that I might be yeah. like shocking, okay. but it's repeatedly doing. That I understand exactly what you're saying, and um, and it's a it, it's a reasonable point, I think. However, um, the, the reality is that since 1945, Germany has been living in peace. Since 1948, since Israel was first founded, and on the the very day that Israel was founded. It was attacked by massed Arab armies and has been attacked repeatedly since. Since its foundation under a United Nations resolution, Israel has been attacked repeatedly. Now, I would not say, I would not say at all that Israel has not made mistakes over the course of those many, many years in which it's been assaulted violently by Arab armies. Um, I would not say it has made, not made mistakes. I'm sure it has. But those mistakes have been no greater than any other armed force involved in conflict. If Israel has killed more innocent civilians than other people, and I don't know whether it has or not, then it's because it's had many more attacks on it than any other nation. Britain, British Army in Afghanistan, in Iraq, I'm ashamed to say some of the incidents that my own army took part in do not bear scrutiny. In, in Northern Ireland, the same thing applies. My, my army killed 13 people who were innocent who should not have been killed in London Derry, Bloody Sunday in 1972. Unfortunately, these things are a product of conflict. Sometimes they're mistakes, sometimes it's willful intent. But I think the, my, the point I've made, and I, I hope you agree with it, is that mo most of the time, Israel is condemned in a way that's different from any other nation. Those Germans, the German commander that, um, that killed those 70 civilians, do you know what happened to him? Did you, did you hear of that incident before? Yeah. You have heard of it. So what happened to the German commander? Nah, I didn't follow. Okay, he was court-martialed and he was thrown out of the service. 
Two German defence ministers resigned over it. The chief of the German army was sacked over that incident. It was a very, very serious incident. But you haven't, you've heard of the incident, but very few other people have, I suspect. It's, the focus is not on other countries. The focus is on Israel. The majority of resolutions by the new United Nations Human Rights Council have been made against Israel. 3,200 to 3,500 people have been killed in Syria since May, which I mentioned before. How many resolutions have been made against Syria? Next question, please. Mm -hmm. Sir. Uh, hi, Colonel Ken. Uh, I was wondering, what do you think is the reason for that slanted uh, focus? International anti-Semitism. I think um, there, are, there are a lot of reasons, frankly. Um, and I, I, I will speak, I think, about Britain because it's... I come from Britain, I understand Britain better than most other countries. And, um, I think, but I think the same applies in, in other countries. Now clearly, in Arab countries, um, there is, a, there is a, an institutionalized hatred for Israel as an entity. Now, that is a, a simple fact. At many times, Arab countries have attacked Israel. At the same time, as so many people claim that um, that the, the, the land currently governed by Israel should be surrendered, should be given back, and that, people, that those Palestinians who used to live there should return. How many people um, argue the case that all of, the Israel, all of the Jews thrown out of Middle Eastern countries in the period from 1945 onward, which is approximately the same number of Palestinians who left Israel, how many people are claiming they should go back? At one, at one point, more than, nearly, not more, nearly half of the population of Baghdad, of Baghdad was Jewish. How many Jewish people live in Baghdad now? Very, very few. I'm not criticizing Arab countries as such. I've got here, I'm going to show you now. I've got here these two medals. I'm not showing off, but I was awarded these two medals by Arab countries for my services in saving the lives of Arab citizens. I was awarded when I was in Bosnia a Queen's commendation for gallantry for saving the lives of, of Muslim citizens in a village in, uh, in Bosnia. I'm not, I'm not saying that to boast or to brag, I'm telling you because although I'm saying that the Arab countries are vehemently opposed to Israel, that does not make me, the fact that I am prepared to look at Israel objectively, it doesn't make me anti-Arabic, it doesn't make me anti-Muslim. But the fact is that the reason, part of the reason for the international hatred and the international opposition to Israel stems from the Arab view of Israel. In Britain, for example, Britain's national interests for many years have been aligned to many Arab countries. And our foreign office is, if anything, is uh, favours perhaps interests in Arab countries over interests in Israeli countries. Uh, the, the Foreign Office will dispute that fact, but that's what my view is. Another reason is anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism in Britain is rampant. It, is not, it doesn't uh, apply to everybody. I know many people, I know more people who are not anti-Semitic than people who are anti-Semitic, but it still remains, and that is one of the reasons. Another reason is fear of Islamic terrorism. Britain suffers enormously from constant plots to, to carry out attacks against the United Kingdom from Islamist terrorists. Only this week, three people were arrested in Birmingham for planning a terrorist attack or planning to finance a terrorist attack. We have had our own attacks. They threatened us to attack. We, many people, want to appease those who would attack us, and so they will side with them against Israel. That's, those are some of the reasons not, not, not a whole answer, not a full answer, but those are some of the reasons, I believe, why we see this situation in the world today. The lady uh, halfway at the back in the pink shirt and the apple... Is that an apple? Yeah. Computer. Okay, in homage to... Uh, what's that guy's name? Steve. Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs, that's right. Okay, I've got one as well. Thank you so much for being here today. I was wondering if you could talk a little, discuss a little bit about what you feel the role that the United States should play in this conflict, as well as the role that your country, your homeland of Great Britain, should play. In the in the conflict between Israel and Palestine yes. and the Palestinian yes. conflict. Yeah. Um, well, I think the reality the reality is 
that, um, and I'll answer this quite briefly, I think, but the reality is that, that the conflict really could only be resolved between the Palestinian people and their representatives and the Israeli government. That's the only way it can be resolved. It can't be resolved by imposition of orders by the United Nations. It can't be, absor it can't be resolved by, for example, the United Nations recognising Palestine as a separate state. It can't be resolved by sticks being waved by people like President Obama or our own Prime Minister. I think they, those countries can, can help facilitate um, negotiation between Israel and the Palestinians, but, but they can't impose a, a, uh, a solution on them. And there has been a lot of effort to try and do so, and it's not at any point worked. And I think actually even more relevant is the role of Arab nations. I think the Arab countries have a far greater potential role in helping to resolve the, the, the conflict than, than our own countries. Yes, so, is it, so sorry, beg your pardon, yes. Um, I'm really glad to hear a member, from, a member of the British Army to acknowledge all the crimes against humanity that have happened in other conflicts. Thank you very much for this. However, I was wondering if um, crimes against humanity can be justified or simplified by the fact that they have happened in another place, knowing that, for example, um, Stalin's administration of the USSR has killed more people than Hitler's. If, however, we should never justify what has happened in Nazi Germany, um, even though of more people have been killed in other places. So I'd just like to know your thoughts about it. Um, I'm, I'm being extremely thick. Could you repeat what, what exactly what the question is? To what extent do you think that um, the killing of innocent civilians can be justified by the fact that they have happened in other places as well? Oh, Maybe I see. For yeah. example, the comparison between the USSR and the Nazi Germany. Yes, no, I, I mean, I, I don't believe the killing of innocent civilians. I think, as, as I said in my remarks, that it's every time it occurs, it's a tragedy. I've seen innocent civilians killed uh, in situations uh, of conflict. And I think it's, it's, it's never really justified, but unfortunately it is a, um, it's an unfortunate feature of modern day conflict. It happens every, wherever there's a war. I think it's, it's, it's made more difficult to stop by the tactics that we've seen used in Afghanistan by the Taliban, in Iraq, by the Shia militias in the south and by the by Al Qaeda and by various other fighters in Iraq, by Hamas in Gaza, by Hezbollah in Lebanon. All of these organisations um, have used human shield tactics. They have deliberately forced members of their civilian population between them and our forces, for example, or Israeli forces, in the hope that one of two things will be achieved, and that is either we will not fire because there are innocent civilians in the way and they will escape, or we will fire and we will then invite international condemnation for killing innocent civilians. This is the way that Hamas, Hezbollah, Taliban, Al-Qaeda, this is how they use their civilian populations. Uh, and they, it, unfortunately, I mean, if you, I've been in this position, I hope you never are, in a position where you've got to make the decision about whether you shoot, whether you don't shoot. It, the Taliban, a common tactic by the Taliban is to use 14-year-old boys, and sometimes younger than 14, in the alleyways and the, the streets of some of the villages in southern Afghanistan to throw grenades at British soldiers, knowing that British soldiers are unlikely to fire back at 14-year-old boys. They won't kill children. It's, it makes it incredibly difficult. When you have to attack an enemy position, when the enemy has deliberately positioned his weapons in the middle of a population centre, what's the choice? Do you let them carry on firing at you, or do you take them out, risking the death of civilians. It's not a pleasant, it's not a pleasant uh, decision to make, and it's not clear-cut. I, I would personally, if I could, I would abolish war. But unfortunately, as the whole of history has shown us, we will always have human violent conflicts, and we're not going to change that. And a product of that will be the death of innocent civilians. Sir, yes. Thank you for your talk. Uh, you, you, you say the ratios to show that uh, it's obvious that Israel didn't target, uh, simply by this kind of statistical analysis, did not target civilians. But uh, I think it should also be pointed out that there are some certain concrete instances 
where Israel had specific information about uh, Hamas uh, headquarters and operatives working, but they did not uh, attack those particular positions because they were close to hospitals or even in the hospital, in the basement of the hospital, as Hamas set up uh, its headquarters there. I think that's a very good point, and, and I think that Israeli pilots, fixed wing pilots, helicopter attack pilots, had carte blanche, unlike in most missions, where the pilot sets out on a mission and he destroys the target. In the Gaza conflict, the Israeli pilots had strict instructions that if they were in any doubt about the likelihood of killing innocent civilians, they had permission to abort the mission, and many times missions were aborted. Many times, Israelis issued warnings to civilians to get out of an area that they were about to attack, obviously taking a risk that their own troops could become an increased danger by the fact they were warning the enemy of their attack and risking the chance of an ambush being put in, um, and also giving the enemy a chance to escape. So I, I think you're absolutely right, and it's a, a very good point. And it's also the kind of tactics that the British and the American forces are now using in Afghanistan. My opinion is, and others may contradict me, that Israel led the way in this, and Israel um, took much greater steps than any other army had taken in the history of warfare to prevent the loss of civilian life in that Gaza conflict. Madam, on the end. Uh, yes, I was uh, interested in uh, a little bit more about your research prior to your testimony in front of the UN. Um, when, after the Gaza conflict, did you visit the Gaza Strip? Um, have you personally interviewed any of the civilian survivors uh, of the attack on Gaza? Uh, could you please explain a little bit more about your research prior to your presentation? My own research is based on um, not just after the Gaza conflict, but before the Gaza conflict and during the Gaza conflict and after the Gaza conflict, on a detailed study of the Israeli Defense Forces and the tactics that it used, on a detailed study of Hamas and its tactics, on interviews and discussions with people including NGO workers, UN workers, journalists and military personnel who were in Gaza during the conflict, a study of published reports, a study of uh, NGO reports uh, into that conflict. I did not visit the Gaza conflict after the after the sorry, I did not visit the Gaza Strip after the conflict, but I've been to the Gaza before, and I've not interviewed any of the, the any of the population of Gaza since. I've had to base my own research on um, extensive investigation plus my detailed understanding of 30 years uh, of fighting this kind of conflict. Thank you. At the back. Balance of uh, scrutiny of Israel, um, and particularly uh, coming from uh, the UK and France, uh, and now even uh, some would say uh, from President Obama. The question is, uh, with the looming uh, specter of Iran of Iran having nuclear ca uh, capability, and Israel in somewhat of, of an uh, impossible uh, choice between going in and risking uh, condemnation from the rest of the world, if it would even be effective, or, or not doing anything. In Risking having uh, the entire Middle East calculus shift. What do you see, uh, what do you see as uh, feasible options uh, in uh, for the region in Israel, or um, as or perhaps at a diplomatic level uh, for getting Russia and China on board? Not to mention new countries. In, in relation to the Iranian nuclear program. Okay. I think. Um, I mean the the International um, <coughs> Atomic Energy Agency. You will have seen its report, I think it was published last week or the week before, which um, pretty much confirmed that uh, Iran is developing nuclear weapons secretly for military purposes, um, which is obviously contrary to Iran's own assertions that any nuclear program is purely for civilian energy purposes. So the threat, according to the IAEA, um, and according to Israel's research, is a real threat and some people would suggest that Iran is perhaps maybe less than a year away from having the capability of deploying a nuclear weapon that could be used either to attack Israel or to threaten other states in the region and of course many other states including Saudi Arabia, including <coughs> states like Jordan, uh, including of course states like, like Egypt are terrified of the idea that Iran would gain a nuclear weapon terrified of it. 
as terrified as Israel is of it. The, um, the solution, it seems to me, is obviously the preferred solution, is to build up pressure, as you mentioned, perhaps from Russia, on top of the pressure that's already, and China, on top of the pressure that's already been built up from the Western world, uh, to build up pressure on, on Iran. My, my view, um, I can't give you a scientific back, background to this, my view is that that kind of pressure under the current Iranian regime is unlikely to really work. They are intent on having a nuclear weapon. They will continue to develop a nuclear weapon. Virtually nothing short of either a regime change or it, uh, military action to prevent the weapon from, carrying, from being developed will change that situation. Um, obviously, it's got to be a judgment for countries like the United States and Israel as to whether um, they should be carrying out a military intervention against Iran. Um, Israel's got to judge, Israel's got to balance the possibility of allowing Iran to develop a nuclear weapon which will threaten its very existence or risking, as you say, world condemnation for making a strike against Iran which may not destroy Iran's nuclear capability but may set back its uh, potential for developing it by perhaps a number of years. In my opinion, Israel is very likely to launch a strike against Iran perhaps within the next year, perhaps a bit longer, in order to prevent that situation coming about. Clearly, no one wants that to happen. I'm, I'm sure the Israelis don't want it to happen. I'm sure Benjamin Netanyahu doesn't want to do it, doesn't want to order it. It would be an incredibly difficult decision to take. Um, but the question is, what is the alternative? I don't see any real alternative uh, at present. At the back. Oh, sorry, do you want me to shut up? No, last one. What, last question? Okay, at the back. Um, how do you feel about the request of Palestine for statehood in the UN, and how do you think will it affect the conflict between Israel and Palestine? Will it need, need to like more negotiation between the parties, or will it radicalize the conflict? But personally, I mean, I could talk about this phrase, and I'm sure you could as well, but I, I don't think it will make any real difference to the situation uh, if, it, if it happens, if it goes ahead, and I don't know if it will go ahead. Um, I think what it might do is to, um, because, you know, a people that have maybe have expectations of being recognised as, as a state by the UN might then find that their, their expectations lead to nothing because it has made no difference. That might further radicalise the conflict, as you say. But I think in the, in, in the round, in my opinion, very little difference was made by the UN declaring Palestine to be a state. I go back to what I said before, that in my opinion, uh, and we're all inside our own opinion, in my opinion, the only solution to the problem will be by agreement between Israel and the Palestinians. Thank you very much.